Hey y'all, my name is Logan Sad, and I am a current sophomore at the University of Michigan pursuing a BFA in musical theater. Studying the performing arts is awesome, but there are some downsides to it. Because artists, especially stage performers, are so analytical about ourselves, disordered eating and bad eating habits tend to be a common diagnosis within the field. My previous knowledge of this is what really interested me in digging deeper into these disordered eating habits. I decided to base my research on college students who suffer from eating disorders. Today, you will hear from two different people about their separate experiences with disordered eating. One interviewee is an engineering major and the other is a musical theater major. Thank you so much and enjoy the podcast. Also, I've decided to keep the names of the two interviewees anonymous per their request. Hi, please just give us a little bit of a background about yourself and some personal information to give us an idea of who you are. I am a graduate student in the Ross School of Business. I am 21 years old and I identify as female. Can you talk a little bit about your experience with disordered eating? Yeah, so right before my freshman year of college, I was at home getting ready to come to school for the first time. And I unfortunately had a bad experience with a man where I was assaulted. When that first happened, the first thing that was sort of my way of coping with that and the way of dealing with it was to stop eating. And that was like at the end of July. And so for the entire month of August, when I was home getting ready to come to school, I wasn't really able to process what had happened and I wasn't able to understand what was going on. My way of dealing with it was just almost like my brain shut down and the way that I dealt with it was just by not eating for that entire month of August. Specifically, what did you notice you were doing unconsciously and consciously when it came to food and different eating habits? I would only really eat if it was in front of somebody. And then when I did, it was like very small portions and I would like figure out ways to hide it. And at the end of August, right before I came to school, this was like sort of the moment where I had a bit of a realization. I was at a Taylor Swift concert with my best friend from high school in Atlanta and I hadn't eaten all day. And at the end of the concert, I felt like I was going to pass out. I had to like run to the bathroom my friend was like really concerned that I wasn't okay, but I told her, I was like, oh no, 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 like stay here. It's the end of the concert, like I'm, I'm okay. And I ran to the bathroom and I passed out in the bathroom. I missed the last like 15 minutes of the concert. I got home safe and it was okay. But that was sort of my moment when I got home that, that night of, okay, I need, to, I need to figure this out. I need to get this under control. I'm losing control of myself and the fact that it's like starting to really affect like things that I love. Like I've been waiting for that concert for a year and I've been waiting for that night with my best friend from high school. This is, this is a problem and I need to figure this out. But I couldn't really figure out yet what my trigger was. All I knew is that it was happening at that point. I was aware, but I still didn't understand why. So after that, what happened when you came to school? here at the University of Michigan. So I came to school and my first semester of college here at Michigan, my symptoms got worse and it was all the same and and what had happened in the summer started affecting other areas of my life too. So it was was the disordered eating. I had these crazy mood swings and I was very irritable to people around me. It was just affecting a lot of different mental capacities and it was really hard for me to hold on to and and maintain like healthy relationships with friends and, and a guy that I wanted to date. Like it was just a combination of everything. Also my eating patterns got really weird because I would go long times without eating, but then I would go with my friends to the dining hall and then I would eat a lot. It was very volatile and it was all very dependent on if things were triggering me that day based on the experience that I had, even though I didn't know that yet. But looking back, I can see like, oh, that was a day where I thought about it or, you know, I saw something on social media of the person that made me think of it or whatever, whatever. Or I was going to go on a date and I got really nervous because of that. And, and those were days where it was the worst. So at this point, you were really struggling with these disordered eating habits. I'm wondering, when did you decide to reach out for help? 
And was it your choice or did something happen to impact the choice to reach out for help? I came home for winter break. Um, I got really sick that semester too. Because I wasn't eating, I ended up getting bronchitis and my body was just like weak. And that actually developed into pneumonia and then I was hospitalized. <laughs> they said when I got into the hospital with pneumonia that if I had waited another like 12 hours, my lungs would have collapsed. So I got treated for pneumonia. That was right before finals. I actually had to miss one of my finals and make it up in January, but I, I made it through finals. I went home and I still sort of had pneumonia, but when I got home, my parents saw me, they realized that I was not healthy and that I was not okay. And that's when we had a conversation about how I could get help. And that's when I started seeing a therapist. And that's when I was really able to understand what had happened to me, how I was processing it and how that had created these symptoms including the disordered eating and these other things I was experiencing. So that's when I was able to sort of figure it out. And I went through a whole process of cognitive behavioral therapy, where basically I was forcing my brain to go back through the traumatic, it was trauma. And I was diagnosed with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And the eating disorder was one of the symptoms of PTSD for me. And then I went through this whole like five month cognitive behavioral therapy to force my brain basically to process what had happened to move past it. And since I finished that process, I have not had any of those symptoms since. Wow. That's amazing. Can you talk a little bit more about your triggers for these habits and how your unique situation on top of the stressors of being a first year college student together influenced the disordered eating habits? I definitely think some of the early triggers were just anything relating to that incident that happened. So if someone talked about it, if someone brought his name up, if someone asked me about it, whenever anything relating to him or the place or anything surrounding it was brought up, immediate. Like that was like an, almost like an immediate switch in my head. And so that was the early one. But then when I got to college, it changed because it was, it definitely became a little bit of a comparison thing of like, I was still dealing with this thing subconsciously but I would see my friends having fun with guys and hooking up with guys, making out with guys. And I didn't because I hadn't really dated much. I thought like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing or like I'm nerdy, I'm too nerdy or I'm weird or like whatever, whatever. And definitely like when I first came to college, you know, there's all these like sorority girls and girls who are like right. gorgeous and have dated a lot and like talking to guys and like dealing with guys is very easy for them. And so definitely a bit of comparison Anything surrounding sort of like guys was, was definitely a, a, a trigger because I was still dealing with that. Those were the biggest ones for me, but definitely the freshman year adjustment of just being surrounded by so many people and the comparison is there and sort of like trying to balance all of the dynamics that you have, like these new friends and like these people that you may be interested in and in friend groups and new place and everything like that definitely was really stressful. And I think that sometimes it was like the stress cul culminated itself through those behaviors. So I think all of that played into it. Absolutely. So treatment for an eating disorder normally would not go to the extent that your treatment went to. Can you talk a little bit more about the treatment and therapy that helped you with the actual disordered eating? I figured out when I was home for winter break that that's what about what the original trigger was and what like how it all started and so once I identified that I was able to find this therapist and I told her like I'm I'm trying to deal with this specific thing and so the first time I ever met with her she asked me about what sort of related symptoms I was experiencing and obviously you know she asked like how do you experience any eating disorders or anything related to that or like what are your eating habits stuff like that and that's when I was like I was honest with her because at that point I knew I was, I knew what was happening and I was very aware of my situation. And so, um, I was really honest with her and I was honest with her about all the symptoms I was experiencing and about my habits and about how sick I had gotten because I wasn't taking care of myself. And yeah, I was really upfront with her about all of those things. And it was one of the steps of the treatment when we were sort of processing is looking at all of these, the ways that it was affecting my life and really thinking about it. And it kind of motivated me to work really hard in the processing treatment to try and alleviate those symptoms and, and get back to being like a healthier version of myself. So that was definitely a part of it was like being really honest and like, like owning 
the symptoms that I was experiencing because it allowed me to really like, okay, I really need to figure this out. And it like motivated me to, to work with her to understand the depths of what I was going through and, and how to get rid of those triggers and how to better handle those instincts when they came up in me. That was a big part of it for sure. You were very lucky to find a specialized therapist to help you manage and overcome these disorders outside of the university setting. In terms of resources available to students through the university, did you ever reach out for help there? So I never reached out to one of the university centers because honestly, I had heard from many older students at the university that the resources here were not helpful. Like my roommate, my first semester in college, she was experiencing a lot of social anxiety and trouble adjusting to college. So she went to CAPS and she told me in detail sort of what her experiences, her experience was at CAPS after she waited, you know, three months to get in. And her experience was so terrible that she came home and told me all about it. And I was like, oh, okay, so that's not an option. They forced her to go to group therapy for social anxiety. And it was just so painful. And she actually ended up leaving the university like after her freshman year because it, it wasn't working for her. And I, I felt terrible for her because she really tried to use campus resources and they failed her. So after hearing that from her and hearing things from other like older students that I knew about how difficult the university resources were, I didn't even bother. What I did do though, was I lived in the Women in Science and Engineering Residence Program uh, my freshman year. And we had a program director who was like this 60 year old woman named Chris and she was just like an incredible figure in all of our lives. Like she was very supportive and motivational and we all adored her. And she got to know each of us like individually and was very supportive. And she had actually opened up to all of us at a big group session with the whole program. She sort of went through like the story of her life very early on in the year with us. And she told us a story, like the, part of her story was that she had been assaulted um, when she was in college and how she dealt with that and how it affected her in her life and how she overcame it. And that was the first time I'd ever heard anyone in my life openly talk about it and i cried that night because i think it was kind of the first click in my brain of like oh my god that's what's happening to me but i didn't put it together until right before winter break and so after winter break after i had sort of put it together and gotten help i had a meeting with chris and i went and talked to her and i told her thank you so much for sharing that with me like it it, it was one of the reasons why i felt able to talk to my parents and get help and identify what was going on so she was a resource to me and i know she wasn't necessarily like i mean she was an employee of the university and she was meant to sort of be a resource to us and support us it wasn't her job to like help me with that but she did and she was very supportive as i was going through treatment she checked in with me all the time and she would have me in her office all the time and we'd talk about it and she was just like the most one of the most important people that's ever been in my life like she helped me get through that which is just something that's so hard and something that not many people openly talk about. So it meant a lot to me. Other than your peers, were you ever made aware of the resources available to you from the university directly? And if so, were you even told how to reach out to them? I remember hearing like people always say caps, like here's caps, here's caps. But I had no idea how to actually like figure that out. So yeah, I guess I didn't really know. Like I knew CAPS existed. I didn't know SAPAC existed until later. So I didn't know that that specifically was available. So I knew that CAPS had existed and I'd heard people say, but I didn't know like beyond that, like what steps to actually take to do it or to like figure it out. The only things I'd heard of that other people had tried and then it, it was like, you know, they had to wait a really long time or they got put into group therapy. And so that's all I knew about CAPS. I knew that it existed, but I didn't know exactly like how to go about it, if that makes sense. For sure. So as a woman going through an extremely important transitional stage in your life, do you feel like there are a lot of people around you going through these same issues? I'm sure that there are so many people in my life who have dealt with this that I don't even know about because every time someone does open up to me about it, I'm like shocked. I'm like, wow, I just always forget that it's something that other people experience and go through. And I have had a few people in my life like open up to me about like disorder eating that they've experienced. And every time that's happened, I'm always like, I always forget that so many other people go through it. And, and I've seen the statistics and I know how many people do go through it. But yeah, people just aren't really that open about it. But whenever people have been, like, I just want to, I want to figure out a way to, to support them and how to help them because I know how hard it is to go through that. And I know how scary it is and how 
patient you have to be and it, it's just really difficult I always kind of forget how many people go through it and how many people are silently going through it or haven't even like in my case for six months aren't even realizing they're going through it don't even understand what's happening like can't even identify it and so that is also something that I'm very sensitive to how does it make you feel to know about the extreme lack of accessibility for mental health resources on campus? It's terrible. It feels very dehumanizing because to you, it's, it's your health. It's your life that's at risk. It's not something that you can just tell someone you're suffering from this potentially life-threatening, life-altering thing. We can't get you in for three, four, five months, whatever it may be. Yeah, it's very frustrating. It makes me very angry. It makes me disappointed that we don't have those resources available to accommodate everyone who, as we all know, like from the statistics, experience this. Like, I really feel like they should do a better job of understanding how many women or people at this age, at this stage in our lives, are being affected by this and at a place where it's so prevalent have the resources available when you know that, that this is a place and it's a time in our lives when people go through it. So yes, it makes me very frustrated and I, I feel like there should be more thought and care put into it because it is our health, it is our life, it is everything. And getting rejected like that from help after it takes so much courage to even ask for help is very frustrating to me. It's extremely frustrating for everyone and I feel sorry for anyone who's reached out and has gotten put on a wait list or been told to wait three months for such pressing issues. Thank you so much for sharing your story and for taking the time to answer all of my questions today. Hi, please just give us a little bit of a background about yourself and some personal information to give us an idea of who you are. I'm a sophomore musical theater major. Can you talk a little bit about your experience with disordered eating and where you believe it originated? Yeah, I guess this year was the first year that I've had time to reflect almost on everything that was so messed up in my head. Because, I mean, everybody goes through it differently, but growing up with the arts, you go through it a very different way than I feel like a lot of other people do. Because... You're in these dance classes, you're in these shows where you're put in costumes, where you're stood next to your peers, and you're taught to look a certain way and eat a certain way and try to fit this perfect mold that's simply unrealistic. And that is thrown at you from however old you start, five, six years old, which is crazy. As a kid, you're supposed to just grow up and be you. And because it's thrown on you at such a young age, that's just how your mind is going to develop. So I guess... I guess that's where the disordered part started for me was just in middle school and in high school being compared so often and not being what I thought I was supposed to be. And so it was a constant battle of do I do this because I want to or do I not do this because somebody's telling me not? It was just like what's what's right and what's wrong was so muffled. And then getting to college... I had an eating disorder that wasn't visible, so it was like a, just a battle in my mind, constantly thinking about what I'm going to eat, why I'm eating this, are they going to eat this too, like can I have this piece of cake at this birthday party in middle school? What? <laughs> um, and then getting to college, I think a lot of people were open about talking about that, and so I realized how common it was and how everybody goes through things differently. You talked a little bit about how the arts influence this unhealthy thought process. Our other interviewee is not pursuing a major in the arts. So can you talk a little bit more about how you think the arts influenced this, this belief and thought process? The competitiveness is what's so scary when you're, in, when you're younger because it's such a wide pool that you're trying to push into. And if it's a real passion of yours, you want to be the best at it. And that's what you're taught to be, is you, you need to be the best if you want to get anywhere with it. And so since it was something that I really wanted to do, I thought I had to be perfect in every aspect, one of them being physically. And 
there's no such thing as perfect. And so when you're younger trying to be perfect, what does that even mean? You're just constantly trying to be something that you're never going to be. So it's a never ending battle, especially in the arts. Because there could be a part that you're too small for that you need to be bigger for or a part that you think that you're too big for and you need to be smaller for. Or you're in a line with a group of people standing side by side, staring in a mirror, and you're just looking at yourself and looking at the person next to you and comparing every day of your life, which hits, hits your heart and it hurts after a while. For sure. Now, talking about getting to college, what did living on a college campus and eating in a dining hall and having thousands of girls walk by you every day, how did that affect the disordered eating? Made it so much worse. Freshman year especially because you're just, you're living on your own for the first time. You're having to make your own decisions for the first time. Socially, but when you're when you're alone, what you eat, what you wear, what you do, what time you do it, is all on your clock now. And I really struggled with that. And especially now we're at the school. This is an extremely accomplished program, and you're with all of these in- insanely talented women next to you. Everybody has imposter syndrome, and then when you especially when you first get here. You don't think you're supposed to be here. So you try to do everything you can to make yourself think that you're supposed to be here. Or at least that's what I did. So walking in a dining hall and seeing all of the food, but thinking you can only eat one thing because that's that's the only answer is like the little salad that you can eat for dinner out of all of this food that you're given and not to eat before a dance class. It was just a lot of struggling with making decisions on food because when you're home, you're with your family, you kind of have had a routine for so long. You're going to eat with your family, whatever your family cooks that night. You have lunchtime, you have after school snacks, you have to eat because you're going all day, all day. And now you're alone. How do you balance that? And I, it was really hard for me to balance that. Did you ever reach out to any university resources that are available to us? I did, and I did not get a response, but so I kind of gave up quickly and decided I had to work for it on my own. Did you know about CAPS before you got to the University of Michigan, or was it a resource that was made available to you once you got here, or did you really not know anything about it? It was way into the process, way after the issue was an issue, which is not right. It was after I had reached out that I heard that CAPS was a thing. And by the the time somebody has the strength to reach out, it's probably too late. (laughs) Or not too late, just a lot harder to to deal with. And that means that person has been, or I, I dealt with it by myself all last year because I didn't know that it was a thing until I asked. Do you think that your fellow students and peers know about CAPS and the mental health resources made available to us through the university? And do you think the university does a good job about promoting these resources? No. (laughs) I just think I know about it now because of word of mouth, not because of what the university has given to me. And because I'm a sophomore and I've had a year to talk with people who have had similar experiences and how they dealt with it, but... It's almost like if I didn't have friends at this university to talk to, I wouldn't know. Because it's almost like these little things are thrown in passing. Oh, yeah, I talked to CAPS. Oh, yeah, there's UHS. Oh, yeah, there's this. But what is that? I need a little bit more. Give me more. (laughs) And you're not given more. How does it make you feel to know about the extreme lack of accessibility for mental health resources on campus? It's just scary because... You're alone at the school, and CAPS is supposed to be the one place that you can go to, and to not even get an appointment is just, it's simply ridiculous. We pay so much money at this university, we should at least have somebody to talk to, whether it's 10 minutes. Just to know that you're being heard is more important than anything, and right now it feels like half the people at this university aren't even being heard. Absolutely. How do you think the university could do a better job of promoting these resources? 
I think having designated people per school almost because I think like people in the school of music theater and dance are going to have different needs and time restrictions than the school of business or the school of law and everybody goes through it differently and so maybe having specific people per school would distribute the wealth and would help with the with being able to reach out and feel more personable because it's such a serious mental health is such a serious topic that's scary to talk to a big panel of people is what it feels like from this huge university but i think making it more accessible per school could be a step so there are 96 of us in the bfa musical theater program just based off your knowledge and your communication with your peers how many people do you think you've heard from that have suffered from similar disordered eating habits or body image issues every single one of them 100 percent. it doesn't mean that it's the same type but everybody has some sort of disordered thought about themselves that is not normal and should not be normal and that needs to change so along those lines one of the reasons i wanted to interview was because of your passion for Mm. this double major you're pursuing (laughs) so i would love for you to just talk a little bit about the major and how you think it'll benefit current and future students within the musical theater department I love talking about this. I, as I said, going through the first year made me realize a lot about myself and made me realize a lot about all the people around me and how every single person struggles with something similar. And I had to go out and learn on my own. And I did a lot of research and I found that that was a huge passion of mine was the science behind nutrition and the foods that you need to fuel your body as a human to feel strong enough and especially in our major we're expected to do eight shows a week which is non-stop extremely physically draining and if you're not fueling your body the right way that's not gonna that's just gonna cause a snowball effect of negative things and I would love to combine the two the reason I'm so interested in this double major is because I think that nutrition and dietetics is something that should play a role in the musical theater major just because it's so we're taught such wrong things as a kid if if anything if it's not taught earlier it needs to be taught in college that the two go hand in hand and that if we're expected to perform at such a high level we need to know how to fuel ourselves at that high level and once I learned that you need more than a celery stick in the morning to get through the day that's what helped me have a healthier not the healthiest but it's because it's always changing and always growing but a healthier relationship with food just learning and having the information. And because CAPS is not accessible and because there's no really class that's required or people that we can talk to easily, I had to find that on my own. But I think that that should, there should be more of a connection, which is my goal. Along those lines, do you think that implementing a nutritionist within the department would help? Because I've talked to two of the football players in my English class and they both have per position on the team there's a designated nutritionist to help them if they need to gain weight do it in a healthy way what to eat to maintain the energy they need to play a four-hour football game and practice twice a day so from what you're saying I think we can both agree that having a nutritionist on faculty within our department would be a good thing not just for the health benefits but also to have someone to talk to when you're not sure what to eat Mm -hmm. because nutrition isn't something that you're taught in high school you take a health class but not a nutrition class so I think we can both agree in a dream world there'd be a couple nutritionists in our department that we would be familiar with that can help us almost curate a plan for your schedule because everybody has different demands during the day. People have different dietary restrictions. So maybe to learn different ways to balance that now in college before we get to school, before we get into the real world, 
is really important. And that would be incredible if one day that could, that could happen. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, that concludes our podcast. I think we've gotten a lot of great insight about the ins and outs of disordered eating, triggers, and treatment that help, and also a little bit of information about our university's response to these disorders and the lack of resources that we are given. So I hope this has given you a little bit of information, and I really appreciate you listening to my podcast. Thank you.